Well, thanks very much. Um, and without further ado, um, what I just basically want to do is just give you a bit of a background to bioenergy. And I suppose the first point I want to make, it's basically a form of solar energy. It's a form of indirect solar energy, whereby um, the sun, um, the energy from the sun, combines with atmospheric carbon dioxide through a process known as photosynthesis to create something called biomass, which is basically growing matter. And it's a bit broader than that because it also includes, let's say, de derived products such as um, animal manure. So basically, you know, um, animals would eat grain or um, feed, and then basically the manure can then be used for um, production of um, energy. So the concept is basically one of a closed loop carbon dioxide system. So it's basically um, carbon dioxide neutral, very simplistically, and that's how it's regarded under the Kyoto Protocol. I'm not quite sure I'm supposed to point this at. Um, I just wanted to illustrate that there's a myriad, unlike some other renewable energy technologies which are fairly monolithic, like wind energy, you've got one resource, one major technology, one major product. Um, biomass can f um, present itself in many, many forms, from very dry, let's say rice straw, right through to very wet, such as an animal manure stream. And there's a whole range of products that you can produce from it. It's one of the few forms of renewables that can produce both or all of heat, power, transportation fuels, and bio-based products. So the, um, the, th the three main um, areas, um, conversion is something called thermal processing, and the very common ones, um, combustion. So most of you be familiar with, let's say, log fires, which is a very simple and primitive version of it. About 90% of modern bioelectricity comes from combustion, and globally, um, there's about 52,000 megawatts of installed modern bioelectricity capacity, which compares to about 45,000 for Australia's total coal-fired power industry. So it's a very sophisticated, mature technology at that one end of the spectrum. The other forms of bioenergy, such as gasification, which is a more evolving technology, I mean, you'd be familiar with reticulated um, towns, gas around cities in Australia, um, kind of prior to the 70s, which is a very similar technology of gasifying coal, but it can also be done with biomass for producing energy products, and something more recent called pyrolysis, whereby you can actually thermally fractionate biomass to produce a fuel-like substance with about 60% the energy content of diesel on a volume-for-volume -volume basis. Um, another area is um, in biochemical conversion. Um, most of Australia's garbage is disposed of in landfills, um, they can basically be capped, the gas captured, which is rich in methane, very similar gas to what's in um, natural gas pipelines, and that can basically be used for producing energy or indeed purified and re-injected into gas pipelines. And the other thing with biomass is that um, there's opportunities for fermenting sugars in biomass, for instance, to produce bioethanol as a fuel, and also the possibility of using things like vegetable oils for um, fuels as well as biodiesel. Just to show you the scale of a typical plant, um, this one comes out of Finland, just to show you the scale. Um, I don't know if I've got a pointer, so I wouldn't know which one to point, but um, there's a little circle around a person on the top left, top right diagram, just to show the scale of that kind of technology. So this plant is of the same order of magnitude as large coal-fired power stations. It runs um, up to 100% purely on biomass. And the fuel supply system, which is on the lower right, is basically a train that basically brings in something called slash bundles, um, forestry residues for running that particular plant. Just in terms of the opportunities with um, biofuels, most people have heard about the food versus fuel debates, first generation biofuels. At the moment, most um, biofuels are produced from things, materials that are very um, much associated with um, food and feed such as using, um, let's say, corn or to, or to use, let's say, the seeds from vegetable oil such as canola for producing biodiesel. Where the movement has been in this technology is to go more towards so-called second generation and beyond um, technologies to basically use um, the waste materials, things like um, agricultural residues and so on, and not the food, to try and move away from this competition, and also for alternative feedstocks such as microalgae. Just in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, and one of the big things driving it, is at the top I've basically shown a range of current fuels, um, diesel, petrol, and natural gas, um, the current um, technologies. And then below that is the so-called first generation, just to show that there's a fairly substantial um, improvement in greenhouse gas performance. 
and that's in terms of grams of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted per kilometer under like control conditions. And the, the, the diagram right at the bottom of the bar, bars at the bottom are the so-called second generation biofuels, which basically show that you can get pretty close to you know like 90 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from those technologies. Just to wind up, last slide, um, just some of the features of bioenergy. It's essentially carbon dioxide neutral, which I hope I showed in the first slide. It can provide for a range of energy products, heat, power, fuels, even bio-based products displacing petrochemicals. It's base load, that's quite important. Wind energy, solar energy, you basically need to have storage, separate storage at additional cost. Whereas in biomass, you basically got the energy actually inherent in the biomass itself. So you can basically dispatch it um, rather than wait for nature to dispatch it, man can. Um, bioenergy is well known to have very large and impressive economic multipliers because of the ongoing um, requirement for um, procuring fuel or, or feedstock for basically running these processes. It can also be allied to waste management. Often bioenergy is not just purely an energy system, it's often tied in with waste management and indeed in parts of Australia um, with these like dry land salinity problems, environmental problem to try and link it in there as well. It's an indigenous energy source. You're basically not de dependent on um, Middle East oil or anything like that. And in the future, possibly, you know, electric vehicles with lithium coming out of Bolivia. Um, can be integrated quite well into fossil fuel systems. One of the um, current, let's say, um, technology pushes at the moment is co-firing biomass with fossil fuels. In other words, using existing infrastructure and displacing, let's say, coal with um, biomass and it's getting quite a lot of currency, particularly in, uh, overseas, where indeed coal-fired power stations have actually been closed down and converted across to biomass. There's a whole lot of um, benefits with the grain biomass as well, biodiversity type, um, and like combating dry land salinity, erosion control, and things like that. There's another point. The Australian government's put about $500 million into something called CCS carbon capture and storage. And if that technology happens to work for coal, biomass would actually then be the only carbon negative technology because it, you'd have actually be sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and burying it. Um, I mentioned the large global potential. And just to wind up, Australia, we get about 0.9% or about 870 megawatts of our electricity capacity from bioenergy or bioelectricity at the moment, which is pretty low by world standards. And I believe there's a huge upside potential there. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, you raised a lot of interesting points. Um, I have a, a, a few questions um, nagging me now. It's, uh, one of them is about the issue of nutrient deplete, depletion of the soil. So, so one of the largest sources of potential biomass that we have right now is crop residue. Uh, but if we're taking the biomass out of the uh, agricultural areas to burn as combustible waste, um, that's going to put additional demands on, um, yes. say, fertiliser uses, and of course fertilisers sure. are currently derived from oil and largely sure. from other fossil fuels. So when you take account of those sort of yeah. life cycle analyses, is it really as low carbon as you're suggesting? Yeah, it's a, a huge emphasis, and I didn't even mention it in this discussion or the presentation up to now, are issues to do with sustainability. And in fact, there's, I ran a debate similar to this at one of our conferences called Will Peak oil lead to peak soil. And it's exactly that kind of concept. And it's very important not to just, let's say, mine and you know, like vacuum up all the biomass. So it needs to be done very um, scientifically, very sensibly, in terms of retaining um, residues for moisture, soil carbon, and such, and such issues. So there's quite a lot of work going into, let's say, those kind of balances, carbon balances, and so on. So um, a lot of the early bioenergy um, opportunities are not actually, um, let's say, directed towards, let's say, vacuuming things up like that. A lot of it, the forestry globally provides about three quarters of the bioenergy as a feedstock. And a lot of that is basically um, harvesting residues, um, silviculture thinnings from, like, improving the stands of trees and so on, which would otherwise possibly even land up adding to fuel loading. Okay, another issue is how scalable bioenergy would be. Um, if you consider the yields per hectare of some of the better crops, uh, 
how much would you need to grow, for instance, to replace uh, the energy equivalent of a coal-fired power station for a year, given that a one gigawatt coal-fired power station might consume three or four million tonnes of coal per year? Right. So let, let's say we, we got a, a dry mass equivalent for biomass of three to four million tonnes. What sort of area are we yeah. covering? Um, perhaps I'm going to just answer the first bit of your, like, your introduction there, in terms of how big bioenergy can be. Um, there have been studies conducted out of the International Energy Agency's Bioenergy Program and, uh, and, and similar kind of studies looking at the potential for biomass. And there's an awful lot of biomass that's produced globally. Um, I think there's about 220 billion dry tonnes of biomass are produced an annually. And that's about just in stark energy terms, and I'm not advocating trying to even use that for energy, but just in stark energy terms, it's about 10 times the planet's total primary energy requirements. So it's really a case of using very small percentages of that. Um, there's a large international trading biomass at the moment. Um, there's about, one thing I didn't discuss is something called wood pellets, energy pellets. And um, th at the moment, there's about 14 million tonnes of that. So you talked about you know, a few million tonnes for a big coal-fired power station. The European Union at the moment is using about 9 million tonnes of energy pellets. Um, okay, that's a slightly lower calorific value than the tonnes of of coal for energy consumption. And just in terms of the scale of agriculture, um, you know, various studies have been done. Um, international energy agencies um, st studies looked at that um, bioenergy could provide, t or technically provide, about three times the world's energy consumption at the moment. But when you start discounting it for, let's say, sustainability criteria and um, non-competition with other land uses, uh, that like lands up at about, uh, I think about 200 exajoules, which sorry, may not mean much to you, but the total biomass production at the moment, bioenergy production at the moment is about 50. So they reckon about four times what it is at the moment. And world primary energy consumption is around 500 exajoules. Yes, yeah, so about 10% yeah. of that. Just in terms of scale, um, the, of the planet's total energy requirements at the moment, about 13% is met from renewable energy sources of all sorts. And of that 13%, about 10 percentage points is by energy in, in its different forms. So it's the and dominant. And all the rest is hydro. Yeah. All the rest is hydro. What people don't realise is, in fact, in Australia, according to a f recent federal government um, report that they did, not just res restricting ourselves to electricity, but three quarters of Australia's total renewable energy at the moment is actually biomass. And a lot of it is admittedly. Um, basically wood, wood for domestic and you know, space heating. We use about four to six million tonnes of firewood in Australia per year. Now, a, a complaint levelled against biomass has often been, especially Generation 1, that it's displacing crop foods, as you mentioned in your talk. Uh, one possible solution to that is microalgal biodiesel, for instance, where you're using raceway ponds or, or bioreactors to grow this in areas where it would otherwise not be productive. Uh, but a, a limitation has been that it requires a concentrated stream of fairly clean CO2 to do that. So yeah. given that, do you see technical windows opening to allow it to be enlarged to move away from just pairing it to, say, a gas-fired power turbine? Can it, can it really scale up to meet a large amount of liquid fuel need? There's a lot of studies that have been done around microalgae, and I think it's fair to say that there's also been a lot of hype that's surrounded it as well. Um, some of the scientific studies I've seen um, do not indicate that this is like the silver bullet that's going to solve all our energy problems. There are going to be niche applications where you happen to have a number of convergent things, such as water, and it's basically going to require it to be, let's say, in wastewater treatment plants or behind the dunes of um, algae, so, um, sorry, of the sea. You need point sources of carbon dioxide, so that may possibly be, at, let's say, near an ethanol plant where the fermentation process produces a clean stream of carbon dioxide. Um, there's a trial going on at the moment in Queensland with Tarong Energy, where they're working with a, an algae company to basically sequester the carbon dioxide um, into microalgae for fuel. So my personal view is it's possibly going to play an important niche application, but I don't see this as solving the world's um, fuel problems. And, and fi the final question from me then um, relates to that, that there is some discussion now of Generation 3 biofuels, if you consider algae to be generation two, um, where they may be used directly to produce 
uh, products such as hydrogen, which could then be synthesised for other fuel uses. What's the state of that technology and how far is it from commercialisation? There's a lot, there are numerous companies that are out there at the moment with innovative technologies for um, producing hydrogen or um, you know, similar kind of um, alternative processing. And um, just recently I came across like a list of 10 companies that are working on like non-conventional biomass straight into like hydrogen type fuels. I think it's a little bit early to really know where we stand with them. Um, most of them are working in secret. Um, you kind of know the name they've raised. You know, they've got their private investors usually sitting behind the scenes. A lot of it has not been subject to scientific scrutiny. You know, there's some good work going on at uh, even at Australian universities associated with um, anaerobic digestion interrupting the processes. So anaerobic digestion usually produces methane, which to my mind is actually a bit of fuel to go with um, for, for various reasons. And, you know, that's very well established. So it's basically trying to interrupt that and particularly um, gear it up for fuel cells, which is another conversion technology. Thanks a lot, Steve. <coughs>